Lecture 10 is the believer's life, the walk of faith. Now, since we have this faith that Jesus is a Christ and all that it, uh, that it encompasses, then what is the life that we should live? The walk of faith is a walk of life that you can live because of faith. So if we have the correct faith, then we can live the correct walk of life, the, the walk of faith, sorry. But if we have the wrong faith, then we'll live a wrong life. So what was the life uh, or the believer's life that we can see in all the Bible? First, it was about obeying the covenant, holding on to the covenant. If we see the Bible, it was all based on holding on to the covenant. If we see in uh, Genesis, we can see that Adam and Eve had, had a single covenant to obey, a single promise to obey. What was the reason why that covenant was given? It was not given to limit people, rather it was given as a sign I am your God, you are my people. That has always been the reason why the covenant has been given to the people of God. So as to remind them that if they walk in the obedience of that covenant, if they hold fast to that covenant, really there will be no problem because they will be with God. However, we know that Adam and Eve had a covenant that we can say is a covenant of works. That is to say, the covenant that they had to hold on to relied on their own strength. It relied on them obeying it and them not doing something. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, we see this command which is not to eat from the a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for the day you eat of it, you will certainly die. That was a covenant given to them. As we know, this covenant was broken. It was uh, torn asunder and then God gives us another covenant immediately. God immediately gives us the covenant that many call the covenant of grace because it does not rely on us but rather it relies on God uh, accomplishing this covenant. However, we can also call it the covenant of the Messiah because it's, it's centered on the Messiah. And now if you are talking about the Messiah and His covenant, it includes certain elements that we should believe. That is to say, if we believe in the covenant of the Messiah, there are certain things that we must obey and believe without fail. Here you have a list of them. So we must believe that he was born, that uh, he suffered his passion, right? He died, he resurrected, and that he sent his Holy Spirit, and that there will be a second coming. Now, of all these elements, most of these have already happened. Jesus was already born. Jesus already suffered and died. This Messiah already resurrected. This Messiah also already ascended and He has also sent the Holy Spirit who is now with us. But there is one thing that is missing. He must come again. He will come again. According to His promise, He is going to come again. Now, what happens if we disobey this covenant? We have now defined the terms of the covenant, but what happens if we disobey that covenant? Um, please let's look at the Hosea chapter 6. Hosea chapter 6, verse 7. It says, Like Adam, they have broken the covenant. They were unfaithful to me there. So this is talking about Adam breaking the covenant and about the Israelites breaking the covenant. When the Israelites broke the covenant, God likens them to Adam who had already broken the covenant. And God is saying to break the covenant is to be unfaithful to me. If you see some other translations, it says something akin to this is close to insulting me. So to break the covenant of God is being unfaithful to God. But Adam did that. Eve did that, the Israelites did that. And it's very easy to point fingers. Because of Adam, now I am in a state of death. Because of the Israelites, then we're in a state of death. But how about ourselves? We have a covenant as well. We were given a covenant of the Messiah as well. Are we keeping that covenant? Or are we like Adam, who through disobedience allowed death to come into this world? Aren't we just the same? We should check ourselves also. So the believer's life is a life you live because you believe. Believe in what? Because you believe in the covenant. And if you believe in the covenant, then you obey it. This is a very childish example, but if your uh, mother tells you, don't put your hand in the fire, it'll burn you, then what happens? You either obey or you, not, or you, or you don't obey. One of the two, right? 
But what happens if you don't obey? Why did you not obey? It's because you didn't believe in her. It's because you didn't believe that her words were true. So you put in your, your hand in the fire and then you get burnt. So that is to say that obedience really results from faith. Faith leads to obedience. If we look at Romans chapter 1 verse 5, please. Romans chapter 1 verse 5. Also, Paul is explaining through um, Romans chapter 1, verse uh, 5, through him and for his name's sake, we receive grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. Paul is saying, I was put as an apostle, I was sent as an apostle for what? So that all the Gentiles, all the peoples may come to the what? To the obedience that comes through faith. That is to say, Paul was not only sent so that people could just believe, but rather through that belief, what would result is obedience to the covenant. If we look at Romans chapter 16, please. Romans chapter 16, verse 26. It says, But now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all nations might believe and obey him. So here it says that the gospel itself, right, the mystery of God, it was revealed now. It was hidden long since long time ago, but now this revelation of the gospel of the Christ is now shown and revealed and made known through all the prophetic writings. For what purpose? So that we, uh, as all nations, might believe and obey. If we look at uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, please. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, it says, Who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling by His blood grace and peace be yours in abundance. Now, when we see all these verses, we know, we know that the Bible is telling us to obey. The gospel was given to us so that we could believe it. And because we believe, we obey. That is, because many people ask, okay, so what can save me? Can my faith save me? Or does my obedience save me? So is it by works or is it by faith? Evidently, the Bible tells us that it is by faith. Ephesians tells us that it is by faith so that no one may glorify himself. The salvation is by uh, believing uh, through that grace that God gives us. However, if we truly believe, James says, have you believed? Then show me your belief through works. That is to say, if I truly believe in something, then naturally my life will live towards that faith. My life will run towards that faith and it will act in accordance to that faith. That is the true life of a believer. If, you, if we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6 tells us, and we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. So God really wants us to have an, a complete obedience. He wants us to have, to have a full obedience. And now, a lot of people may get confused on what obeying is. So, okay, I need to obey God, but what is obeying God? There is a verse that encapsulates um, this, uh, this obedience to God in, a, in such a, a compact manner. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, Jesus himself says, Then Jesus said to, this, to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. It says, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. And a lot of people find this very hard. We've tried. I know that many of us have. We've tried to deny ourselves. And we think that denying ourselves is uh, forcefully killing our desires. And it's forcefully getting rid of what's not godly. And it's trying to do it with our own strength. Denying ourselves is about abs abstinence. And it's about um, getting rid of things. However, if we truly look at the gospel, then we'll realize that denying ourselves is as a result of believing the gospel. If I have believed every problem in my life to be solved in the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then what is left for me? What desire is left for me? What problem is left for me? Nothing. But if I don't believe that that cross or resurrection is perfect, if I don't believe that that applies to my life perfectly, then I will still keep on living for 
myself for my problems. And that is how I can, I, I find it hard to deny myself. When I don't believe that that cross and resurrection is enough, then I cannot deny myself. However, if I believe that that cross and resurrection is perfect, then I can deny myself. And denying myself means dying to myself, just as we have explored in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15. He died for all so that all that live should no longer live for themselves. That is the faith that the Bible is telling us about. And also, in the second part of, of this verse, it says, He must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, a lot of people, when they say take up the cross, they imagine a uh, specific hardship given to them. So, for instance, a lot of people say, Oh, my cross is my wife. My cross is my husband. My cross are my, chi my children. And it's become so common that it's become an idiom, right? But that's not what the Bible is telling us about. What is the cross really? What is the meaning of the cross of Jesus Christ? It means that all that suffering was, uh, was already done. All that suffering uh, was already overtaken for world evangelization. To take up our cross means that to evangelize the world, to do God's will, we might have to suffer as well. In 2 Timothy, Paul tells uh, Timothy to suffer like a good soldier of Christ. Because no one who has been called as a soldier, a soldier meddles in civilian affairs. That is to say, if we're called as soldiers, if we're called to do God's will, then we might have to suffer for it. We, there might be some affliction. Remember Stephen. Stephen, he was a, a deacon who, who was sharing the gospel. He was sharing the gospel, yet he was being stoned. Yet he did not hide to preach another day. Stephen just preached the gospel. And in fact, he was praying, and the Bible says that his face was like that of an angel. He realized that that problem was no longer a problem. He could deny all of that problem. He could carry up that cross. And also, when it, means, when it says to carry up that cross, it does not only mean the burden or the suffering of that cross. It also means that we're carrying the cross of salvation for the whole world. It means announcing the gospel of salvation. And Stephen was just doing that. His face was radiant and he was even praying God please do not take this against them for they don't know what they're doing and he became a martyr that is how a Christian should live of course now at this age there will come a time for persecution and martyrdom but really to deny ourselves and to live for the sake of the will of God that is the life of faith that is the life that our faith leads us to so those who follow Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, if I follow Jesus Christ, it tells me that I will become a fisher of men. That is to say, God's blessing upon those who have believed the walk of faith is related to, the evangel uh, to evangelism and to evangelizing the world. John chapter 8, verse 12, it, it also says that those who follow Jesus Christ never walk in darkness, but in the light. That is to say, not only is my life devoted to God's will, but also it is devoted to what God is giving me. I will never walk in dar darkness, but in light if I remain in the gospel. So we live with the Lord. The life of a believer is a life of Emmanuel. It is not a burden that God has given us to live a life of faith. A lot of people think that they are burdened with that life of Emmanuel. However, uh, sorry, with that life of faith. However, God has uh, given us the blessing of Emmanuel, which means that God is with us until the very last day. God dwells with those who are saved. God is with those who have believed. And if God is with those who have believed, uh, for one part, it means that if He is with you, then what's the problem? There's no problem if He is with you. But on, an, on the other hand, it means what great responsibility we have before our Master. We're walking with Him, with God. In uh, Romans chapter 14, verse 8, it says, If we live to the Lord, if, if we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. Our life is no longer ours. It's no longer for my desires. 
because I am with the Lord, I live for the Lord, I die with the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31 says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. What does this mean? It means that everything that it's in my life, it should be in service to the will of God. That is the walk of faith. It's not having my own interests in one hand and having uh, God's interests in another and trying to balance them out as many Christians do, but rather it is because all of my interests have died already because He has taken care of everything, now I can take God's will in both hands and run with it. He has provided for everything. He already solved everything. So whether I die, whether I live, whether I eat, whether I drink, everything should be done for the glory of God. And that is what the Holy Spirit is guiding us to do. If I occupy myself, if I truly live for that world evangelization, if I live for God's will, then I will have no time to gratify the sinful nature of the flesh. Now, we have uh, said that living a life of faith, living a believer's life, is holding on to the covenant. What covenant is, uh, is the covenant that we have now? What is the covenant that's left to be fulfilled? He already, uh, he, he already came to this earth. He already died. He already resurrected. He already ascended. He already sent the Holy Spirit. But there's one covenant that is remaining. If we look at um, Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, please. Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. It says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. So among all the signs of the end, there was one sign that corresponded to the church. That is to say, among all the earthquakes, wars, famines, all the chaos in the world that would precede the coming of the Lord, there was a mission for the church. There was, some, there was a covenant given to the church. When this gospel of the kingdom, when this gospel of the Bible is preached to all nations as a testimony, then the end will come. Then the Lord will return. Then the covenant will be fulfilled. So what was the mission of the early church? What was the life of the early church? Why did they preach so vehemently? Why did they run with such passion? Why did they stake their lives? Why did they sell everything and put it to the feet of the apostles? Why did they share everything? Why were they not afraid to deny the name? Why did they die for that? They believed that Jesus is the Christ, that all problems have been finished in the cross, and that their life should be given to this cause, to evangelize the world so that the Lord may come. Now, if you see this verse, verse 24, it's not, uh, sorry, uh, verse 14, it's not about a relaying of information. It says that the gospel will be preached as a testimony. Let me ask you, how many people in Canada know the name Jesus? How many people in Canada know that Jesus died for their sins? I would dare say more than 90%, right? More than 90% of Canadians know the information that, uh, uh, that Jesus had, has died for them on the cross and, and that He resurrected. However, has it been given to them as a testimony? Has it been get, relayed to them as the life of someone who truly believes that Jesus is a Christ? Has the gospel that Jesus is a Christ truly been presented to them? I would say maybe not even 1%. So there's a lot of things that, the early ch uh, that our church, that the church here in Canada and ourselves, that we're accountable for. And when should this happen? A lot of people live for the covenant in their spare time. That is to say, okay, I have the covenant. God wants me to save people. God want wants me to rescue the souls, but I'll do it after my family. But I'll do it after my needs. But I'll do it after, you know, all those things that were solved in the cross. But, uh, Let's check this verse, please. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 28. Matthew chapter 16, verse 28. Jesus himself says, I tell you the truth. Some of who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, imagine you're the apostles who received that word. Jesus was telling the apostles, some of you will not taste death before you see the Son of Man coming in all His kingdom. How would you have lived? 
That is to say, when Jesus told this word to the disciples, they believed that Jesus would not come in 500 years. He would not come in 1,000 years. He would come in their lifetime. Some of us will not be dead and Jesus will come. It was very fast for them. So every waking moment of their lives, it was to hold on to the covenant and to fulfill the covenant of what? Of sharing the gospel to the ends of the earth to testify that Jesus is the Christ even if it cost them their resources, their life. Even if it cost them all of that, that was the happiest life they could live. That was the life that God truly saw and He was amazed by that life. That was the life that pleased God. That was the life of the early church. What about us? Are we holding on to the covenant, really? We might say with our words that yes, we're living for God, we'll live for God's will, yes, we will die for God, but are we truly living this covenant? Are we? Because this is not about a seminar. It's okay, maybe we won't meet after this seminar is over. But before God, are we, are we leaving, living this covenant? Are we believing in this covenant? So to summarize, Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of God. Only through Him can we meet the Father truly. The Holy Spirit constantly gives us testimony about this Christ. And the Holy Spirit has come to us so that we might also give testimony of the Gospel. Now the life of a believer is a life that results from faith. Obedience is something that comes as a consequence of faith. And what do we obey? We obey the covenant of God, which is the covenant of the Messiah. And of that covenant, many things have already been fulfilled. The cross and the resurrection is perfect, but there is one thing that God is waiting for, that God is still in the process of doing, and that He's waiting for us to do it in simple terms. He's waiting for us to evangelize the world, but 2,000 years have not been enough. We believe our interests to be more pressing. However, God has promised some of you will not taste death before you see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. Many apostles died. And in the end of the first century, many were asking, okay, Jesus promised this. He promised that some of the apostles would not die before they saw the Lord coming. But now all the original apostles have been martyred. And so what's going on with this promise? Did Jesus lie? Or did we misunderstand? Did Jesus already come and we did not realize? What's going on? The world was not evangelized yet. And this same verse, Matthew chapter 16, 28, was not only given to the apostles at that time. This is the faith that He desires of us, of each one of us, to live for the coming of the Lord. And that's when I can be called a Christian. Acts chapter 11, verse 26, tells us about the first instance in which the disciples were called Christians. It was not themselves uh, calling themselves Christians, it was their enemies calling them Christians. They saw that life of obedience. They saw that walk of faith, of believing in Jesus as Christ, holding fast to the covenant and living for that covenant. They saw this in those people. And that is why, in a derogatory manner, they would call them Christians because they were so similar to that Christ. Today, do we have that? Today, are we living that life of faith? This life of faith has been lost in the whole world because the gospel has been lost. And because the gospel has been lost, it's not losing hold of one thing. If the, if the rock has been lost, everything that's edified on that rock crumbles down. So if the gospel is restored, if that rock is restored, our life of faith that follows from believing that, that should be restored as well. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you because you have allowed us to share a little bit of the gospel. Please allow your Holy Spirit to convince us of, of what we need, Lord. Let us live for the sake of world evangelization, to stake our life on it, because we will be facing you one day, Lord. You will come as judge and... Lord, we desire to be your faithful servants up until that day. In the name of Jesus, who is the Christ, we have prayed. Amen. 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 So we'll have a 15-minute break, and then we'll continue on.